when you're forecasting, when you're doing your forecast, whatever, in the morning, let me ask, how many measures of precipitation do you have? Like you might have a high elevation station, low elevation station, one with your neighbor on the other side of the ridge. I'm guessing you have multiple ones, right? Uh, how many measures of wind do you have? Multiple ones? Okay. Um, how many measures of temperature do you have? Multiple? Okay. How many measures of radiation do you have? Uh, operational forecast, not the researchers. Right. Mostly, uh, I'm, I'm guessing you have zero. So I was teaching a CA level two course over 10 years ago. This is the week long course for professionals. And as part of the forecasting factors, people were asked to do the solar radiation in words. And one group of very experienced people said intense. And another group of very experienced people said negligible. And I thought, we can measure this. What do we use in words and opinions and whatever when it's something we can measure? And I had a, a graduate student, Laura Bakerman, and I said, you know, let's do something useful that we can use in a forecasting operation and uh, for this radiation. And she developed the model SWARM, which is just a small part of where I'm going. Um, but let me um, yank it up here. So it's a free spreadsheet. Um, and uh, there it is. It's just an Excel spreadsheet. So the little center, top center box, the green things, you put some values in there. There's the Latin longitude. It's not terribly sensitive to that. We better update this here. And today's April. Second, and uh, what's the sky today? Kind of overcast? Broken? Broken. 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 How many days since fresh snowfall? Two? Five? Two. Two. Three. Oh, we'll call it three. <laughs> so let's look at this graph over on the left here. And let me just. So everything in Laura's model for the incoming radiation had been already published before. All these inputs and how that comes through. The radiation coming through the atmosphere depends on cloud cover, depends on the orientation of the slope, uh, depends on the day of the year. In the Latin longitude, that's not right for here. But So what we see here on, that's uh, steep north, and this is steep south here. Um, so steep north is 6.4 degrees, and that's warming down 10 centimeters. And uh, so if you look at the curve in the snowpack for the temperature gradient in the coolest part of the, the night, usually towards morning, and you warmed it up in the daytime, and you went down 10 centimeters and you looked at that change in between those two curves, okay? That's what this is. This is what's predicted on steep north. This is what's predicted on steep south. Okay. But everything coming into the snowpack, being absorbed in the snowpack, is already published. All she did is calibrate it to a, a knoll, tree line knoll at Rogers Pass. What wavelengths? What, what wavelengths? Uh, she's using uh, peak shortwave. Peak shortwave. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, she tried various measures of shortwave, and the peak correlated best with what she was trying to do. Okay. What happens if we? Say it's clear sky. What's going to happen to that little faint blue line? Okay. There's going to be a lot less getting around to steep north and a lot more getting into steep north. So we developed this here. This is the field book note that you can write in your field book here. This is steep north. That's this number right here. This is steep south. And that's there. Now, if you say it's well, I think down 10 centimeters it's minus 5, and your silly model is telling me it's going to warm up by 18 degrees. Well, it just means it's going to hit the melting point. But Swarm doesn't know the temperature down 10 degrees, but that is proportional to the absorbed shortwave radiation on that slope. And I think we need another little box down here that shows the absorbed shortwave radiation instead of putting it in degrees. But anyways, there's a huge difference in the cloud cover. Now, what if we make it zero days? So it snowed last night. What's going to happen to that curve? Okay, it's more reflective, so we get less all around, both on steep north and on steep south. <coughs> What's it look like if it's 
overpass. Okay, it's the same all around. Okay, steep north and steep south and steep east and west. And I turned on the line for 40 degrees. We can turn on the line for anything else we like in through here. Okay, so a simple model, it's catching on. And I know my staff for two years, we don't go out the door without running swarm. Okay? Just like you look at precip, you look at wind, you look at temperature, you look at swarm, and it's just part of your morning routine. Right. And I'm going to refer back to swarm in a minute, but I, let me talk. So, so Bruce, other than the new snow, um, the, like the snow surface would change with if it had melted slightly. You know, Swarms for dry snow. It will okay. underestimate okay. absorb short wave for wet snow. Um, so this was a, an accident that I happened to be called into, and so there's a group switch back in their way up through here, a group of five skiers, they get up to this point, and the slope releases, um, and I got flown up, started the transceiver search, we didn't know how many people were on the slope, and I spent the afternoon with this person here with a dislocated hip, who was doing very well. The other S's are the survivor, this person here died. There's two very experienced Canadian Avalanche Association groups here, very experienced instructors, and this group got dusted. In the debriefing afterwards, talking to them, they said, the snow was not slabby. I wouldn't have been there if the snow had been slabby. It snowed about 15 centimeters here overnight, about 25 centimeters over here, and very experienced people were here saying, when they moved their groups up, the snow was not slabby. When I came down at dusk after the helicopter lifted my patient out, uh, I was skiing down and I would just touch the side of everything and it would just rip. Okay, I'd ski down the bed surface, go over, touch my skis here and it would rip. It went from being not slabby in the morning to being wildly slabby and unstable in the afternoon. Um, and it's west facing. so. It, Snowed overnight, cleared up in the morning, and the sun hits this, and the accident happened around midday on a west-facing slope. What's the date, please? That's what I'm coming to. That's the kicker. <laughs> okay, it's December 7th. And people keep telling me, I don't want to run swarm. Don't tell me about radiation until March. This is December 7th. Okay. Um, air temperature is not a huge factor in terms of daytime warming from the overnight cooling to the afternoon warming. That's hugely dependent on the short wave going into the snowpack. Okay, now 90% of it bounces off, but the 10% that enters the snowpack is mostly responsible for the daytime warming. So now we're ready for this case study. Thomas Exner uh, did a, uh, prepared this presentation and it's about an avalanche cycle on February 2nd and 3rd in 2012. And I was just 50 kilometers west of there at uh, Rogers Pass. And we got blindsided by this particular cycle. But, and we went the only ones. So here's this high building up. Uh, the precip is over. The sky clears. And the sun comes out. And this is PM stands for the Purcell Mountains. And I'm just you know, 50 kilometers west of there and I'm teaching an avalanche course. Um, so February 2nd, we got freezing levels rising and we got the sun um, on the uh, slopes, especially on the south facing slopes. And so here's the forecast from the uh, forecast center. Number one problem, wind slabs. Number two problem is storm slabs. And number three problems is persistent slabs. And let's look at persistent slabs here. It's in the possible size two to three range, mainly on the north through east, and quite interestingly not on the south. This is kind of a generic profile. We've got 40 to 80 centimeters of storm snow, a well-settled mid-pack, facet layer from mid-December, and then some basal facets down near the ground that and 
So it's a step down snowpack, but it's not a, I've seen a lot worse step down snowpacks and I'm sure you have as well. Um, so here's the, what Swarm is doing. So the solid line there is the overnight cooling and Swarm down 10 centimeters gives you the maximum change. Uh, okay. And you've already shown you Swarm, so I'll, I'll move on here. So here we go. Um, February 1st is overcast and the sun comes out, the snow finishes, the sun comes out. <coughs> here we have, there's nothing happening here the last day of the storm. Okay, no new naturals and steer accidentals, okay? Bang. Numerous natural avalanches to size 3.5. Also deeper layers ripping out. Here's Swarm jumping from 2.4 to 9.3 when the sun comes out. Uh, this is steep south. Steep south during the overcast day, uh, February 2nd, steep south after the sun comes out. So yeah. sky condition, swarm, and forecasters are feeling pretty good. So you look at this and you think alpine, considerable, tree line considerable than moderate, uh, actually lower tree line here, and we have numerous natural avalanches to size 3.5, that's the destructive scale, and deeper layers are ripping. Um, they missed it, but I was at Rogers Pass and teaching and we missed it as well. So this blindsided an awful lot of people here. Uh, there were no injuries, by the way, out of these uh, numerous natural avalanches. Uh, the next day, it's the peak of the cycle, more avalanches up to destructive size 3.5, lots of propagation and um, uh, danger levels haven't raised. Forecaster is, or sorry, Swarm is saying 10.3 on steep south. And then the next day, the avalanche activity stops. Um, swarm is still saying high values, okay? So it's the third day of intense sun on the steep south facing slopes. Swarm is saying you got a lot of warming down there, 10 centimeters, but something's changed. So we got two things happening here. We got a start of avalanche activity, and we have an end of avalanche activity. Um, they raised the danger rating on the day when there was no avalanche. Yeah, yeah, and the head forecaster, uh, when he first saw this presentation, um, said, well, I don't, I'm going to go back and check. And he went back and checked, and he said, yeah, we missed it. And I said, well, I was teaching an avalanche course, and we missed it. So that's just... Uh, Did you miss it on the third, too? <laughs> no, <laughs> no, no, we, we missed this. We didn't miss this. Uh, and we had our guard up here. We would just... You know, we were just not going into avalanche terrain after these two days. And the actual fact, there were no new av avalanches, but, so. Um, uh, okay, here's a summary that uh, they came up with after the fact. Uh, they came out on February 4th. So mainly south-facing slope. Freezing levels are rising. But because most of the avalanche activity is south-facing slope, um, um, I think the uh, shortwave radiation is more important here than the rise in freezing levels. And they talk about uh, loose wet coming down and uh, hitting the open slopes, stepping down in basal weaknesses, but there were lots of them. That's their opinion. My, I was there, and lots of them were starting dry. Uh, so there were dry avalanches. The sun hits them. They release a lot of them on the mid-pack facets and some of them stepping down to the near the ground and produced a huge avalanche to the destructive scale size 3.5. Okay. Um, so Thomas said, well, it's not just the warming. You've got to have the loaded gun. I'm sure you have a lot of shortwave radiation coming into the snowpack and 90% bounces off with it. 10% that enters the snowpack can be fairly influential. Um, uh, you got to have the loaded gun. In this particular case, we do have the loaded gun, and we got fresh snowfall. We hit it on the south-facing slopes. We hit it. it whatever it does, uh, contracts, whatever, and has rapid settlement, somehow uh, releases these avalanches. So we got this, we got freshness, and we got the loaded gun in the deeper snowpack. And that was a factor the first day, February 2nd and 3rd. By the time the 4th came, maybe the south slopes have done it, done their thing, but 
Uh, we didn't have any avalanches on uh, the 4th. Um, and I don't think freezing levels were a big factor because it was so, the avalanche activity was predominantly on the sunny slopes. Um, so warming alone uh, probably doesn't do the trick. You need the loaded gun, you need the slab and weak layer combo. Uh, and in this case, the step down potential, which was nothing remarkable. That's kind of a normal Columbia Mountain snowpack, you have that kind of step down potential. But, um, and Usually the first uh, shortwave radiation is a more effective trigger. By the time it was on day three, they didn't produce avalanches. The first day and the second day, we got all the direct sun on the sunny slopes, the south facing slopes. We got all the avalanche activity. And on day one of the, after the storm, February 2nd, there were a lot of people kind of <laughs> changing their forecast. <coughs> 